the world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, your family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Cashflow Ninja and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. You can grab a copy of my book, The 21 Best Cashflow Niches. You can subscribe to my newsletter, The Best Cashflow Niches Newsletter, in which I share one brand new, well researched cashflow niche every single month. And you can join my mastermind, Cashflow Nirvana, which was built for freedom seekers and wealth builders, business owners and investors that's looking to protect and build wealth during turbulent times. It's all at CashflowNinja.com. I've got a fantastic show for you today. I'm joined by Dr. Kolya Spori. He is an adventurer, always seeking uh, incredible adventure and experiences. Um, he has traveled to every single country on the face of the planet, but he prefers to travel to uh, war zones uh, and meet interesting character and see things for himself. That has earned him the nickname Dr. Danger Zone. I'm super excited to have Dr. Kolya Spori on the show today. Kolya, it's great to see you. MC, great to see you too. It's been a fascinating, uh, just a journey to getting to know you. And I have really enjoyed our conversations. So as I said in the intro, very excited to, to have you on the show. Dr. Danger Zone himself, which we'll get to, uh, Dr. Kolya Spori. Um, for folks that are not familiar with you, Kolya, and, and what you do, can you just please give a, a little bit of your background um, and share a little bit of your, your journey with them? Yes, MC. Uh, I'm German. I'm 53 years old. My life uh, in uh, the south of Germany was boring until age 11 when my parents were posted to Istanbul, where I spent six years at the German high school. And uh, that was a formative time of my life uh, because uh, Turkey was a bit tough at the time, military regime. So um, times were bad, people were aggressive. So I had to learn a little bit to defend myself. And um, it was also... Uh, uh, politically important because later on I learned that Na NATO had installed a uh, sort of secret uh, leader there with uh, the Turkish president Kenan Evren was part of the Gladio groups that were also active in uh, Germany and Italy and these people were basically uh, creating um, um, attacks against the civil uh, against the population and blaming uh, in that case, the communists, but uh, therefore having as a reaction, the military take over uh, the country. And uh, this dialectic we see even played nowadays. And I learned it firsthand in Turkey at the time. So I, I did my high school, finished it there. And then uh, I was a windsurfer, uh, tried to become a professional, did a lot of traveling around the world, including Hawaii at the time. I was a wave windsurfer. I finished studies uh, in economics and I started to work for Hugo Boss as sponsorship manager responsible for worldwide sponsoring, which uh, gave me the opportunity to travel a lot, see a lot at a high level, like in Formula One racing and um, golfing uh, and uh, tennis, Davis Cup at the time, uh, IndyCar racing in the USA. So I had a exposure to a high powered world relatively early on in my first job already, which was also my only salary job because I was already an independent libertarian anarcho-capitalist long before knowing it. And uh, 
I created my own company uh, from that contact network, in, especially in Formula One. And then also went to the America's Cup in sailing to, um, for example, uh, represent Larry Ellison's uh, Oracle Racing at the time, brought him BMW as a main sponsor and spent time at several America's Cups. I was also in the offshore powerboat scene, class one, which is owned by Qatar. Uh, so these sports all have something in common. And um, I had a fantastic time there, a lot of uh, good contacts, good uh, friends and uh, fantastic travels. At some point, I uh, realized uh, that uh, it's possible to visit every country in the world. And that's when I started to sort of drop out of the system. And I basically traveled for more than the last 10 years focusing on uh, understanding this uh, uh, this world and um, to visit every corner of it and turn every stone and dig for a lot of truth and uh, i think that journey has come sort of to an end uh, because i don't think there's much more i need to understand nowadays but many people started to wake up and it was a process uh, that brought me here and to meet very interesting co-combatants like yourself mc <laughs> that's that's a fantastic overview. So back to your um, days at, at Hugo Boss and then um, starting your own company, which got you involved with the Formula One and specifically in Monaco, right, where you where you still uh, have, have a residence. Um, you know, one one of the things is that that you've shared is just meeting incredible people there and connecting you know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, just that part of, of your life before we get into the, the traveling and the, the danger zone traveling? But because it is a skill set, right? For a lot of people listening in our, in our audience, connecting other people is, a, is an extremely powerful skill set. When did you realize you had that? Was that just at, at Yugo Boss already that you can then take that skill set into in, um, you know, into, into your new business, into, into this venture. And then what were some of the, you know, you've met a lot of extremely interesting people. What were some of the interesting relationships formed and, and people that you've met? Yes, that's a good question, MC. First of all, I'm not a natural communicator and there's a lot of people who don't like me because I'm a bit too German or I'm a bit too much uh, a critical thinker and uh, I will happily sacrifice uh, a, a good mood uh, when uh, a political subject uh, comes by and uh, ruin the atmosphere. Uh, like at the uh, Christmas dinner at home, we all know the situation. And uh, in business, I uh, I functioned well, like uh, in Formula One and Hugo Boss for quite a long time, uh, because um, a language is important. Uh, I speak a couple of languages and I think if you're a, a guy who knows sports and um, who knows the, 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 the typical thing that people like to talk about, uh, men like to talk about. Formula One is about uh, driving fast and living in the fast lane. So that's a mode you have to be comfortable with, which I was at the time. And how did I get in there? When I was a windsurfing uh, amateur uh, co uh, competitor, I started to market myself to sponsors and I did a round the world trip, marketed to sponsors when I was maybe 20, one years old. And uh, with that skill, actually, I actually got the job at Hugo Boss, which was above my level uh, usually, uh, because I had already proven that I can uh, live well in the sponsorship world. And so here we are in, for example, the Formula One paddock or on the, on the jetty in the America's Cup in New Zealand. And uh, these are very closed environments uh, where the entree is often not... Uh, uh, be bought by money, but people just have to be a big sponsor to be in the uh, Formula One inner circle. And I was in there, which helped me to meet interesting people like uh, uh, what I recall at the moment. I, at Hugo Boss, I, I watched uh, the first meeting of Don King, who is well known in the US as uh, this box promoter, with Jan Tiriak, who may also be well known. He is a fantastic guy, billionaire in Romania who was a tennis champion and manager of Boris Beck at the time. And they are both physically very um, imposing people, like tall and crazy. And they met and it was, I was the only witness when they met for the first time because I was handling the VIP shop in the Hugo Boss headquarters. And it was part of my job when those big guys came in to, to show them around. 
so that's uh, that's a moment I, I remember. Um, I met Mike Tyson as we were staying in the boxing world um, at a party event at the table next to me. Uh, in, actually, it was the Grand Prix in Istanbul. And when a friend of mine who was guest of mine asked for a picture with Mike Tyson, a, a selfie, in the moment when the picture was taken, Mike Tyson put the finger in the ear of my friend. So he has a weird hobby with ears, Mike Tyson. Uh, so um, I've also been professionally involved with heavyweight boxing uh, with the Klitschko brothers or with Vladimir at the time, uh, where I don't have any contact anymore because he's uh, now involved in the war very much. And uh, that doesn't make me happy. Uh, I met a lot of prominent people, uh, like sports stars. That's the given in, in my in my job at the time. Uh, there are still friendships from those days with racing drivers, for example. But uh, sort of what I was interested in is meet the big business people in the background. And uh, Formula One attracts the most amazing people uh, from corporate CEOs, which I don't really um, respect that much anymore as at the time, because they're running corporations and are in a way just slaves of uh, of the system but um, there were some sh amazing figures like the biggest weapons dealers in the world i basically had around me very often uh, at the time i started to learn mm, this is how it goes uh, for example the main owner of mclaren manzo oji who passed away a very uh, polished fantastic half arabian half swiss guy was one of the biggest weapons dealers in the world and uh, so it, 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 this Formula One attracted um, all kinds of people. And I think the trick is uh, whenever uh, you're into relationships, you have to give more than you take. Yeah, They don't want people who just uh, suck energy or, or want their money. And um, it also helps when you have something to tell, like you have own experiences that they haven't heard of before. And throughout my life, I've built that up because now I have experiences that very few people have by traveling to some of the most uh, difficult and dangerous places in the world and meeting some of the sort of world famous people who run those places. So then <laughs> the next step is easier because people want to hear that story from me too. <laughs> right. And you also meet a lot of royalty, political leaders, you know, through the, those, because essentially I think you, you mentioned uh, kind of like humorously that it was almost like a World Economic Forum meeting every, you know, every other week, basically, you know, now obviously it's a bad connotation to, to the World Economic Forum, but it's, it's a similar kind of setup, right? That, that was my uh, sales pitch uh, for sponsorship in Formula One, that every two weeks or almost every weekend you have a World Economic Forum over a whole weekend, uh, two or three days which is a very powerful time, a quality time to meet people. Uh, and it's true, it still works like that. And Formula One is still the best sport, I believe, uh, for, for people who want to make contacts uh, business to business. Uh, I, I didn't mention um, sort of all my contact worlds. Uh, one of my most fascinating dinners was um, Helmut Kohl, our former chancellor, yep. and um, uh, Michael Gorbachev at a relatively small table of uh, 12 people. And I had a lot of time uh, talking with Helmut Kohl, who is much better than his reputation. And Gorbachev, it's, it's the opposite. He was not the brightest candle on the cake, honestly. I didn't know, but because I wanted to talk to him, I, I said, um, uh, sort of, Mr. Gorbachev, I'm so glad to meet you. And uh, my parents actually uh, lived in, uh, in the Soviet uh, empire at the time. And he asked where, I said, in, uh, in Akmola which is nowadays Astana, and in those days uh, was the Lakmola. He didn't know the name of the second biggest town in the second biggest country of the Soviet Union. Uh, so how could he run uh, responsibly his uh, empire? He couldn't because he was just a stooge. And this is how I collected information. Yeah. Uh, also later I understood who was his handler and why was the Soviet empire brought down. Uh, but these personal contacts are important. So I, I don't want to do name dropping, but I've met a couple of um, uh, sort of statesmen and um, politicians uh, and uh, warlords and um, certainly celebrities, lots of them. But uh, I have even at the time not always had respect for them. But now as I avoid mainstream uh, media uh, completely, uh, it's just ridiculous uh, 
you know, the kind of people that are hyped up and have a sort of higher status for the people outside there, just because they show their face in some stupid television show. This world is, uh, is completely gone for me. I want to take a moment to share something very important right now. Are you trying to figure out how to protect your savings from the banking collapse, which has already started, and the coming financial crisis? Most banks will fail. Deposits that are not insured by the FDIC will be lost, and there will be bank bail-ins. And this collapse in the banking system will lead to chaos in the financial system. Banks also provide loans to real estate investors. So what do you think is going to happen to lending in the event of a banking and a financial crisis? You can be proactive and position your savings to protect it and also have access to it to use it to buy discounted assets by positioning it in your own banking system through the infinite banking concept strategy. Producers Wealth has put together a presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com where you will learn how to position capital outside of the banking system and the Wall, Wall Street casino, just like the ultra wealthy, to protect it and create a pool of tax-free liquid capital to capitalize on the massive opportunity to buy discounted assets, which is coming. You can access the presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. What I love about, and, and, and this is why I asked that question, what I love about your, your journey is that, um, and I, I appreciate you even uh, sharing your, your childhood experiences, is we all build models of how the world works. And most people rely, as you mentioned, on mass mainstream media or mainstream education and academia. And, and from those sources, they build their the models which they think the world operates on or works a certain way <laughs> where you know uh, we, when you want ac more accurate models you have to actually as you mentioned you know travel research seek for the truth flip as many rocks as you can and then obviously seeing that side you know from your experiences at, at you know traveling around the world which we get to you've been in every single country you know your experiences as a, as a as a windsurfer into Hugo Boss and then into the world of Formula One you start to build completely different models than what the average person has on a daily basis so you have a different um, model on which you think the world operates on and and helps you make sense of the world which then puts you in a position to go, I know exactly what's going on right now. And what's coming next is not a surprise for me where the rest of the people will just be left shell shock from going from the one crisis or the one event to the next crisis. Right. That's a very good point. Uh, shell shocked. I uh, understood the contradictions uh, relatively early. For example, uh, what's been going on in Palestine, uh, was touching me and the double standards that apply to this conflict zone and uh, the United States uh, being an aggressor all over the world, but up being presented to us as uh, sort of the leader of the free world. And those contradictions I could already decode for myself. I had one friend in Formula One and the America's Cup, uh, quite a high level guy, at the time, he told me, Collier, the good guys always win. And it took me a number of years until I understood what he really meant. It means that the guys that win write history and they define what's good and bad. So uh, the good guys obviously always win. Over time, with my travels, I understood that television and uh, especially Hollywood media are there to arouse uh, arise a state of fear of constant shell shock, as you said, uh, which makes uh, the, the populations more manageable out there. And I saw in my travels that the countries that were stigmatized as being rogue, dangerous, uh, the bad guys, uh, they were often much uh, you know, easier to travel in and population more friendly, system had let, less red tape. 
And I experienced firsthand the propaganda that I was under in the West for a long time. And uh, sort of the learning process in the end led to the conclusion that everything that we learn in school and in the media in the West uh, that is of political interest is the opposite of the truth. It's all an inversion of the truth. And um, it is actually a very uh, freeing uh, uh, understanding. It, uh, it does help to uh, live um, better uh, emotionally. Um, the soul is more healthy. Um, I was just going to say uh, the old quote, uh, the truth will make you free. This is a bit of a, a, a trap, this uh, wisdom or this quote, because it's um, when uh, Rabbi Loew uh, uh, created the golem, which is basically a, a dumb slave for his tribe in Prague a couple of hundred years ago, he put the name truth uh, emet on his uh, tongue to create a golem, a slave out of mud. So when they say the truth sets you free, it's already contaminated with uh, another hidden truth. But this is too uh, steep for the early part of our discussion. <laughs> no, but it's very, very powerful because, um, yeah, you do have to, I mean, the if regardless of, of, of where you find yourself in the world, right? If you're a truth seeker, a freedom seeker, or a wealth builder, the decisions that you're going to make for yourself and your family and your community and your business and even your investments um, is only going to be as good as the information which you process and which you uh, um, uh, analyze, right? So if you if you don't understand what information you're processing and an analyze, it, it it's already flawed, and you're not going to make solid um, decisions based on reality. Um, to your point, I believe it was it Napoleon that said they asked Napoleon. They said. How would you want history to remember you? And he kind of like just kind of looked at the person funny and said, what are you talking about? History, remember me? History, history will be written by whoever is victorious, who ends up winning. It doesn't matter what I think or why I, I want to be remembered. If I get beaten, you know, <laughs> they're gonna, you're going to write whatever you want. Um, and I think there's a quote, which is pretty funny from Norm MacDonald comedian that passed away in the United States that says, it says here in this history book that luckily the good guys have won every single time. What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> so, Wonderful. So I, I should have looked up, uh, as with everything, the person who had already said that before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no. these are fundamental truths that uh, we can pick up over a lifetime. And for me, it was always important to go to original places of history or into the power sense, because um, after almost 20 years in Formula One and my own business, I uh, stopped being so motivated. And I was already in my traveling mode and in my truth mode. And I said, I want to understand really the financial system. And I already had my doubts at the time. Uh, and I, I worked for Rothschild uh, for one year just to understand. It was not easy to get in there, but I have good contacts in all directions. And at the time, right. I did get uh, that consultancy job. And uh, so as an economist, I had never heard how uh, the Federal Reserve System really works. I had to learn that myself. And then I went deeper. And I think people who watch your show, we all share the same knowledge about how the fiat money system is wrong. So. I'm not going to go deeper, but what I want to say is I took the effort to get right into the power center of that system. And uh, this is uh, sort of the story of my life. I'm always able to, 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 to poke in there, even if I maybe don't become a major player or a leader in, in that particular field. But I'm always good enough to be a small, cleaner fish on the, on the, on the biggest uh, sharks there. And uh, I've, I've seen a lot of big sharks. <laughs> yeah what is the fish that swims underneath the shark the remo like a remora fish right so and you i don't I, I was just looking for the word in english i called it the cleaner fish but uh it's because it's a german translation but i will happily learn a better word for that how did you say i think it was remora but i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure but it's the little fish that swim underneath the shark and that's what i appreciate appreciate about your travels too 
is you go where, where, where your interests are and you travel and you really try to get to, to the truth. So let's talk about your, your travel. So you've traveled to, to all the countries um, around the world. Um, and there's a, there's a specific club for this, right? That's right. Uh, we are talking about systematic travel. That means yep. you tick off the boxes of countries or even smaller entities like uh, you know, every state in the USA and every canton in Switzerland. And so you come from uh, the starting point. The first list is the 193 United Nations member countries. There are more countries. For example, Scotland and Wales are not in that list because they are not an, an autonomous member country. Uh, so you can come to about 220 countries that FIFA counts, the International Soccer Federation. Uh, but uh, the important uh, clubs are um, counting about 375 entities. That's the Traveler Century Club, which has uh, the longest history since the 1950s, I believe, and meets very much physically in chapters all around the world, but it's mostly old people. Uh, and then a younger American who is a good friend of mine now, Charles Vele, created a new club, which was just online, was free of charge, called Most Traveled People. And he, counts, uh, he counted at the time 750 entities in the world, and now he's at 1,500. And this Most Traveled People Club uh, was only online, and people did not really meet physically. So I created an annual meeting of the Most Traveled People in the most difficult places uh, called ETIC, Extreme Traveler International Congress. Why in the most difficult places? There's two aspects. In order to get the big names, the big guys from my travel scene, I had to uh, have an event at a place they had not yet been to. And this was more than 10 years ago, Grozny, Chechnya, where I had contacts already. And uh, the, the country or the Republic within Russia was ready to accept uh, visitors. So timing was perfect. And we've now met with my ET Congress in uh, uh, Mogadishu, in Baghdad, uh, in the FARC founding Republic of Marketalia, which was really exotic. Uh, we have been to recently Holo Island in Bangsamoro, Mindanao, Philippines, where there had been no visitors since 1970. Uh, there were no visitors before us in the FARC Republic since 1960s. And uh, I was also in a part of Karabakh between Azerbaijan and Armenia that was a wasteland, ghost towns called Agdam, where there were no uh, people uh, like foreigners since 30 years. So wow. my ethic also helps to reignite, uh, modern work people would say, empower uh, the locals to uh, turn their economies around towards guests and tourism, although always early stages, because it's still dangerous probably, and it's still not all in place. But um, this ethic has become... Um, my event, my annual event, and I'm a bit proud of it because I realized that by packaging the top travelers in the world, big doors open. I would never be able alone to get with the whole leadership of FARC to their hut in the mountains where they were founded in 1960s. For this, I had a group, so it was an unintended consequence of my plan to have interesting people meet that now we get to places that would have been closed for us individually. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Penumbra Solutions. Live Settlements Investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic market and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. If you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing live settlement investments, Penumbra Solutions at cashflowninja.com forward slash life settlements. That's cashflowninja.com forward slash Life settlements. The password to access that webinar is penumbra, all lowercase. Un unbelievable. And, and you would have a completely different view of all these danger zone areas that you've gone in that what now the most of the public think they know about as presented to them. I remember in one of our conversations, you were sharing how you've been traveling 
uh, down to the Donbass several times since the war started there in, in 2014, right? It was around 20, 2014. Um, what was, you know, yeah, if you could share so, some of your experience uh, just there, because I believe that, that you were in an uh, area where there were shellings at that stage happening too, right? So you have a completely different view of, of what's going on in the Ukraine um, you know, how you even got there is, is, a, you know, is also a question I have, because uh, that must have taken quite a bit of uh, coordination uh, and planning. But yeah, uh, if you could share just some of your experiences, um, you know, of that danger zone that you went in. Yes. So at Donetsk uh, uh, or the Donbass region, which is the basin of the Don River, which is historically always uh, important uh, where battles have been fought. Um, for me, it was a, a quiet place as part of Ukraine, and I had crossed it twice during normal travels from Germany to Russia by car. Uh, so now we're in 2014, and uh, the CIA putsch in Kiev uh, puts a new regime in power, which immediately cuts off uh, the Russian people and the Russian interests uh, within its own country to agitate those uh, two let's say, ethnic groups against each other. And as a direct result, the Donbass uh, uh, becomes autonomous to defend itself. Uh, and uh, the war uh, that was already a physical war at the time, but um, was relatively quickly um, ended with a peace agreement or a, uh, a ceasefire agreement, um, the so-called Minsk agreement. Uh, when I went in 2015, it was ju just after the Minsk uh, II agreement. And I was not interested in the war or in the politics. I just saw there was a new entity in the world and I wanted to go there. And I thought it should be peaceful enough uh, if there's a, a ceasefire agreement or a peace agreement. So I entered from the only possible way at the time and still up to today from the Russian side because the, the Ukrainian side, Western Ukraine, had uh, cut off access to that part of, of its own country. At the border station uh, from Russia to Ukraine, or in that case to the Donetsk, uh, what they call themselves Donetsk People's Republic, I saw still a lot of um, empty shells on the ground and uh, a lot of debris. And uh, so the shooting, the active shooting had actually reached the Russian border, but was pushed back by the Donetsk people with help of the Russians, of course, but it was always mercenaries, no official troops. They had pushed it back uh, about 150 kilometers inland to the city of Donetsk, which I reached from that border without any problems, just using a taxi. There was no such thing as uh, a visa or hassles at the border or questions. It was, and it still is, by the way, the war zone that is the easiest to access in the world. Of, of any major war zone. So I'm sitting in the Atlas Hotel, which was at that time, at that time still called the Ramada in Donetsk. And uh, this is the place I knew already where uh, sort of the, the main players meet, uh, which was Russian mercenaries, which looked quite decent, was not sort of wild guys uh, shooting around. No, no, no weapons was okay. Uh, the local old volley, the big guys and beautiful girls. I was sitting on the terrace, smoking my cigars in the afternoon, relaxed. And suddenly I hear a thunderstorm coming up. I look into the sky, there's no cloud. I asked the waiter, please, I mean, I, I don't get it. There's a thunder, but there's no cloud. And he says, it's not, the, it's not the weather, it's the shelling. I said, come on, shelling? Here, it's a peace agreement. No, no. They are shelling us every day uh, since uh, one and a half years or what it was. And so I went from the, uh, the hotel through town and I saw also uh, the, the holes uh, where shells had hit the, the streets. And at that time, there was a little danger of drive-by commandos, which the West was still using against the eastern part, against Donbass. So it was a bit of a danger zone, or quite a bit of a danger zone, but, which I didn't expect because there was a major peace agreement. Yeah. which we now learned through Angela Merkel that uh, the West only went into that peace agreement to gain time to, in the end, <clears throat> become strong against Russia again. Here's another element uh, that some people don't know. The 
Minsk II peace agreement came about for a reason. The West did not want to sign that, but there were several in the battles between, uh, in the early battles at the time between Ukraine and those Donbas republics, uh, the Do Donbas republics were strong fighters and they created cauldrons. And in the, uh, the Balsevo uh, cauldron, they encircled, I think, 50,000 uh, Western forces, like mainly Ukrainian, but there were also uh, more than 50 Western military consultants, especially French and German officers. And when the cauldron closes, what's going to happen to those foreign officers? In order not to embarrass the whole of the Western world, the East allowed a peace agreement in Minsk. That's why it's called Minsk Agreement. And Angela Merkel flew there. I think she was in Brazil. It was a long flight to get there. She was in a hurry. Francois Hollande from France went there in a hurry to a guy they would never seek if they wouldn't have to in Minsk to President Lukashenko and Putin also came in and they signed the agreement. You can see the, how the power uh, force goes because the West was under pressure because of the cauldron. So the West had been shelling the East and only civilian parts actually, it's sort of a, a war of attrition f for eight years. Uh, I witnessed it in my second visit and in my third visit, uh, which was never reported in our media. Uh, just to keep this war situation going. And it was against their own uh, Minsk peace agreement. And uh, I think about uh, 14,000, one four uh, uh, East Ukrainians were killed because of this by the West, um, which, and, uh, we, you know, which, which is a different picture. Like when you read the official travel warning up to today against um, the Donbas republics, it says, oh, this is a crazy part of the world. There's only mafia. You will not get out of uh, alive. And they are bad people, blah, blah, blah. It's all uh, a propaganda uh, against the West. And the enemy, uh, evil Russians, was built for a long time. And uh, actually, in this war, the main victims are uh, the victims of this NATO aggression are uh, the Russians and the Germans, the Germans, uh, luckily not physically this time, it happened two times 100 years ago and 80 years ago. Uh, and the Ukrainians provide the meat grinder. I'm sorry for them, but many Ukrainians are pumped up by pro the Putsch regime's propaganda. It seems like they want to die for this stupid war. A lot of them want. Uh, it's a very aggressive situation uh, when you sit together with people who are ethnic Ukrainians who know that you've been to Russia like myself or even in the Donbass. I'm, I'm not allowed to enter Ukraine. I'm blacklisted because I was in, in those Eastern republics and I, and I was in Crimea. Uh, so that says something, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. Um, and then one of the other fascinating trips was down um, in, uh, well, there's, there's been quite a number, but one of the other ones that, that you share too was Somalia, right? Which is <laughs> also, if you try to think of a danger zone, I mean, it's a, that's, a, that's a pretty danger zone right there. What, what did you see in your, on your travels there? And um, you know, what was different from uh, as it's portrayed to everyone in the media that, that you saw? Uh, Somalia is really uh, dangerous. Uh, that's true. And uh, what's not true, uh, you can actually go there. It's sort of a touristy thing to go to Mogadishu because you have to book, everybody has to book a local uh, guide or a fixer. Uh, and then you have to choose a hotel that's not going to be blown up because they have all been blown up at some point. And also my hotel where I was I saw the pictures when it was only uh, half of it and the rest was taken away by a bomb. So this you have to take into account. There is a risk in Mogadishu for sure. Uh, I was also in uh, two other parts of Somalia, in Harge Issa, which is the capital of Somaliland, which is former British Somalia, which is the most uh, accessible and clean and safe part of Somalia. Anybody can go there, no problem. And I was also in a part that's even wilder than Somalia proper, that's Puntland, where the pirates come from. The pirates are 
actually all made by, uh, by the British and their services uh, to control that part of the world. Uh, that's another story. And I was in Puntland, in the capital of uh, uh, Puntland Bosasso, invited by a, a wealthy friend of mine who provided not only the private jet, but also highest level security, ex-SAS people, and the top executive of Constelis, uh, who also bought Blackwater. So normally I don't have this kind of uh, security backup uh, when I chose my mode of travel. But in this case, it was interesting to, to be accompanied uh, with uh, such professionals. And of course, a lot of armed guards, which you also have in, in Mogadishu. Now, here's a little anecdote from Mogadishu that touched me. I was traveling in our uh, bulletproof uh, land cruiser. We were three uh, foreigners in the back and two guides in the front. And there's a st street crossing and we are asked to stop because the presidential motorcade was just turning uh, in front of us. So we have to wait one big car, one tank uh, and so on after the other. And now at the point, it seems they are all through. And then suddenly a black car with high speed follows that presidential motorcade right in front of us. And I'm already saying to my driver, hey, look, this is dangerous, go, go. I wanted him to move because I thought it was an Amok driver who's gonna blow himself up. This driver then, instead of going through the big concrete barriers into the presidential um, entryway, uh, I mean, huge uh, blocks of concrete, he sort of rock climbed on it with his uh, four by four black pickup car. And I didn't know it was possible. You can, uh, with your front wheels, it climbs up and then the back wheels uh, get traction and he jumped over it right in the back of two pedestrian women who didn't see it coming and he killed them on the spot right next to me and that was a moment that obviously I can't forget uh, it was one woman completely black uh, Muslim dress and the other completely orange so I assume it was a younger one maybe the daughter uh, that touched me and at that point the driver also understood something is wrong and he started to go away but my situational awareness is usually much quicker than those uh, locals and i always try to control my environment and uh, here i was just waiting for that amok driver to blow up his car but uh, that didn't happen it's uh it's quite fascinating and you mentioned chechnya too uh in one one of your tra travels and, and and meeting with those folks what was what was that kind of like because that's also another port that is there there's a lot of um misinformation not a lot of people understand that most people can't find it pointed out on a map you know to be to be honest so that that's also been like a very um you know misrepresented part part of the world what was your experiences there very positive it's one of my favorite places but how did i get there uh, one of my closest buddies is an austrian businessman who is in the luxury goods business and he has contacts all over the world uh, like uh uh, some famous American politicians who buy his stuff, but also Russian politicians who buy it. And uh, so he loves to travel uh, hardcore like myself. And we were together in Afghanistan and in Libya uh, in the Battle of Benghazi, I think in 2010. And after those two trips, we looked at each other and said, what's going to come next? I think we've reached uh, sort of the climax of uh, danger zone travel, especially after the Battle of Benghazi. And I said, I would like to go to Chechnya. And at the time, Chechnya had even much more of a danger zone spirit. For example, the Lonely Planet Guide, which I still read at the time, said going to Chechnya and Ingushetia without a local connection and protection is like walking on the moon without a spacesuit. I remember that. <laughs> so when I had told my buddy about this place, he called around in Russia and it turns out that the president of Chechnya had already bought some objects, luxury objects from his company. Oh, wow. So the entree was quite easily made because the president of Chechnya was interested to meet at least my buddy, but I was there. And that, because I speak Turkish from my youth and a lot of the Chechen upper class parked their children in Turkey during the years of war, I could talk. And also have the mentality because it's a different mentality in the Caucasus in general. And uh, this helped me to really connect. 
for my body to, bus to business. And I became friends with uh, the Kadira family and especially one of his cousins, who's a strong guy there, is a close friend until today. I've been maybe 10 times and Chechnya has developed very much for the better. When I made my uh, traveler congress in 2014, they started to have the first tourists. Uh, but now they have many visitors, uh, not from the West, but uh, from the Arab world. And um, it's a beautiful place. It's totally safe. It's the safest part of Russia. It's much safer than any, any American city, much safer. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you look at the statistics, and I mean, yeah. Um, but Benghazi must have been a, a, quite an experience. And you have a completely different view of Syria. You know, what I find fascinating is at the same time in the West, especially the Western media is bombarding uh, the airwaves and, and online about, you know, the war in the Ukraine and invasions. And also so at the exact same time in Syria, the U.S. is now building a permanent military base and they've now occupied almost what a third of of, of syria so, so yeah. it's just it's just incredible the, the the reality versus what people are told right what was your experience like in in syria yeah it's very important what you mentioned those double standards this is the foundation of the western world putin called it the empire of lies and it's so true what does this inversion this double think this double speak those double standards mean uh it's actually part of the philosophy of Kabbalah and of the Freemasons and of the Jesuits. A friend of mine went to a top Jesuit school and he learned that the opposite of the truth is also the truth. So for these people, it's very natural to lie. And uh, the story of the Syrian conflict is a lie from start to end. Uh, it was started by the West to uh, get rid of um, Assad and a country that was uh, running well and prosperous and where they wanted to build pipelines through. So in order to fight Assad, they created uh, an enemy, which was Islamists, which were already formed uh, and created by the West in Afghanistan called Mujahideen and then Taliban and then Al-Qaeda. And then they were uh, brought to uh, Syria and called ISIS. And uh, one of the front men of this, uh, doing this dirty job was uh, uh, the American politician McCain, Nowadays, his uh, pendant would be uh, Lindsey Graham, who went with McCain to Ukraine and ignited the same sort of uh, undercover war there. And in Syria, the people suffered tremendously. Um, uh, and um, actually, they, they would have lost the country if, um, if Russia would not have stepped in. Uh, it was also the Chinese and the, the Persians uh, helping the Syrians. And what people from the outside don't understand, Syria is not a Muslim country. It's very secular and it's very um, mixed racially, like in Aleppo, which in itself means white, by the way, like Alba, uh, which was the most destroyed city I've probably seen. Uh, there, there's a lot of blonde women. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not an ethically, ethnically homogenous place at all where this enemy propaganda that we have here, like, oh, they're evil terrorists and uh, like ISIS is their own uh, homemade terrorists. That's all uh, propaganda. And uh, it really touched me to enter Aleppo a couple of years ago to see the destruction. And it's, it's probably even the oldest major city in the world, Aleppo. It's much older than, uh, than all the other places there. Uh, and the West was talking about Assad bombing his own people with um, with chemical bombs. Uh, I mean, what a bullshit. The only people who have ever used uh, chemical weapons are the Americans, uh, and especially in Korea and Vietnam. Uh, so it's, it's sad, uh, but it's important to see it on the ground. And you know what I was also surprised about? It was possible all those years to enter Syria and to enter Aleppo, uh, because I was for a couple of years also too afraid to go in there. I thought it's too wild. It's, it's like a leopard skin. This front line is moving too quickly. But uh, this uh, well-known American senator, is it Black, Richard Black? I hope I don't say it wrong. He was in Aleppo maybe in 2017 at the height of the conflict, very courageous uh, as an American. And uh, so nobody tells you this in the West. Uh, it's against the propaganda. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors. My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. Pick one. 
at The Real Asset Investor, Dave and his team bring their investors high-yield investment opportunities across several asset classes for cash flow, tax impact, and equity growth. He and his team are one of the top five ATM operators in the country, and they have an investment opportunity available to accredited investors right now in the ATM space. To learn more about their ATM funds that produce tax-free cash flow, visit therealassetinvestor.com. That's therealassetinvestor.com. What are some of the most, um, because, you you know, uh, taking the conversation from the danger zones to some of the most beautiful places that that you've seen, because you've, you've traveled everywhere. What are some of the most beautiful places that, that, that you've seen that, that that's not on the map, you know, that you're not going to find on, you know, all, all of the travel magazines. Interesting uh, question. I mean, the, the famous beautiful places, they are great, but maybe they are overrun by tourists like, um, Bora Bora is super beautiful. Uh, and, um, you know, the wildlife in South Africa or Botswana is super beautiful. Uh, it's only the prices that maybe keep the huge crowds out, but it's touristy. Um, a hidden gem for me in terms of beaches and uh, sunshine was a little island in New Caledonia, which is part of France, but in the South Pacific, uh, called Ile des Pins, the Pine Island. Uh, which I found super romantic and not overrun. There was only one hotel there at the time. Uh, I've done a lot of little islands in the South Pacific too, but my mode has changed. I'm not interested in sunshine and staying in the same spot as, uh, several nights. I have to move. I have to you know, keep moving, sometimes drive the whole night. Uh, I, if I'm stationary, I get sick. And so the biggest beauty for me was seeing the cold areas of the planet, especially Siberia. I have driven all over Siberia on ice roads, uh, like Stalin's dead road, uh, so-called. He wanted a railway built uh, through a big part of the north, uh, mainly by German forced workers uh, after World War II. And there's a famous anecdote. So he was drawing a line with a ruler from where the railway should go. And at one point, his thumb uh, uh, made a little uh, bent in the in the marking of the ruler. <laughs> and uh, so they built it with the, with, with the bend, uh, which was just a mistake. And uh, that place is, um, is lonely and, and cold. I experienced minus 62 degrees in winter Celsius. Wow. Uh, that's close to the, the all time record, uh, which was in the same area. We're now talking about the road of bones in Eastern um, uh, Siberia, Yakutia. Uh, and, um, a Magadan area where, you know, you, you drive endlessly in the cold, like through a tunnel. It's a very cleaning uh, mode of moving. Uh, you, you think much deeper, much better over time. It's, it's, uh, it's something I don't want to miss, but it's very hard. I went to the northernmost uh, street end in the world where no Westerners had been before us. It's called Anabar Bay. It's higher north than uh, Taktu Yaktuk in Canada or than the North Cap in, um, in Norway. This, this place is uh, so lonely and you have to bunker uh, your own uh, gas. And uh, it's 4,000 kilometers from the last big town, Irkutsk, to that point at the Polar Sea and back in small, normal cars. This is the kind of adventure that showed me the beauty of our planet. Uh. Yeah, it's, you know, what's, what's interesting is when I grew up, people talked about the beauty of the desert, you know, and when I was younger, I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about the beauty of the desert? And it could maybe have a similar kind of um, relation. And then I saw the desert and went out in the Kalahari desert and so forth. And then you look at that. And like you said, there's no one there <laughs> you have to drive in there with your own food and your water and all that kind of stuff. And it is, and then you sit there and you look at it and you look at the sunsets and stuff and you're like, man, this is beautiful. It's, it's something else. It's, I, I, I you know, I can feel that it's kind of similar to that, right? Yeah, it, it cleans the mind. And um, yep. I have uh, one desert experience that is quite rare. I went through the Ilemi Triangle, which is a disputed area between uh, Ethiopia, 
Kenya and South Sudan, which is itself a new country. So it doesn't belong to anyone. And it's really wild to get there. I went with a smuggler and uh, there was a sandstorm. So it was my wildest desert moment ever uh, uh, that not many people would know about. But I have done Sahara North South two times. And uh, I mean, there's lots of deserts all over the world uh, in China and in um, Kazakhstan and uh, in Australia. But for me, the white desert, the ice desert is the most appealing. Yeah, absolutely. Kolya, um, this has been fascinating. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your insights and, and your journey and experiences and so forth. I always talk a, a little bit on the show too about, um, you know, we, well, we talk a lot about freedom seeking, truth seeking, wealth building, uh, especially wealth building during turbulent times and so forth. But it's also about leaving a legacy. So I always say, if you cannot pass on any money, capital to future generations, the next generation with three principles or values to help them, you know, in, enhance their living experience, you know, if they're trying to build wealth or just trying to achieve success and, and happiness in whatever field they want, what, what would you share with, with future generations with regards to principles and values? I have to think a little bit about that. Uh, in the meantime, I can explain that I don't have a next generation. I'm since more than 25 years with the same woman who I love, uh, no children, but we have a dog who is just barking in the back. <laughs> a dog is perfect to um, uh, become a happy person. One of the most famous uh, German women of history called Hildegard von Bingen said in uh, the year 1000 something, so long ago, uh, gib dem Menschen einen Hund, dann wird seine Seele gesund. It rhymes in German. It means give man a dog and his soul will uh, heal. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an advice that I have for, for anybody who wants to listen to that. Now, what uh, to pass on to the next generation? I think... Timing is essential in life. At a, a young age, you have to work under a different mode and, and, and principle and uh, seeking success than later on. I think it would be a mistake to be a truther and a completely awake person when you're young, like uh, 20 years old, because then your life's going to be ruined. You cannot function in society as sick as that, so as that society is, unfortunately. If you understand how it works, uh, you have to compete, uh, be it in sports, be it in business, to, to become a, a wholesome person. Because if you don't hone your skills like that, uh, you're at least an outsider, or maybe you're not uh, even um, a person with skills at all. But then comes the point where you start a learning experience. And then you have to look into yourself, what's your value system? Uh, I think that uh, this old saying that the last shirt has no pockets is very important. Uh, why uh, hoard uh, wealth? Why build wealth uh, as an abstract uh, building and then uh, you die and uh, like in many cases, nobody even gets it and it goes to the church or whatever uh, other bullshit idea. Uh, so with the wealth you have hopefully built in your competitive years, do something interesting or good. Now doing good is a very, very relative thing. I, uh, I very much follow the uh, quote from uh, Doug Casey, who said, uh, I think it was Doug Casey, um, foreign, uh, foreign aid is uh, money from poor people in rich countries uh, going to rich people in poor countries. So most uh, help that we give to others is not really help. It's just a system. It's just the mainstream. Uh, again, I would encourage people to go themselves to places that need help and do uh, something that works and uh, supervise it on the ground. I did a, a convoy to the refugee camps in Dada, uh, Somali refugee camps that was in 2011, where there was a, um, apparently a big drought and people starving. And it was all bullshit propaganda. I was there. There was not a big problem. Uh, so uh, I, I went there with the medical equipment and money and bought stuff. And it wasn't interesting experience for me but what i took away is this whole charity business is one of the biggest part of mainstream lies so don't fall for it uh, so 
go see with your own eyes if you want to help and uh, don't delegate it to the system. Uh, wealth has many uh, facets and um, relationships are probably the most important part of wealth. Uh, it's also to keep the soul intact. And uh, if you need help in whatever means, it's good to have uh, friends that you can count on. Yeah, ab absolutely. And you continue to learn, you continue to research and you write about all these. It's fascinating. I've been thoroughly enjoying uh, reading, reading it online. Where can folks um, read your blog that you're uh, writing and where can they follow you and stay informed of all of the many projects that you're involved with? I have a blog called Luxury Rogue uh, on WordPress, but the best is just to enter my name and uh, then you'll find my blog. And uh, I have about 200 blog posts and it's non-monetized. Uh, people ask me, why don't you sort of make money with it? I say, for me, travel is like sex. Uh, uh, once I uh, charge money for it, uh, it changes uh, forever. So I, I just do it for free. And uh, so uh, I did write a book in German, which was a bestseller at the time. And uh, bestseller doesn't mean much. It doesn't make money to, to the author in this case. Uh, you can um, contact me with questions directly uh, by, by email. I usually answer. And... Uh, I have a Twitter account, uh, a small one. So uh, I'm not one of those people uh, with a mission to to reach a lot of people and to to monetize myself with it. Uh, you get a very honest advice and sometimes uh, a very politically incorrect advice. That's why it's still online and not uh, censored. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this has been a blast and so many things to take away from here. Uh, from our conversation. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your insights and all of your knowledge and your experiences and uh, providing so much value to all of my listeners and my viewers. Thank you, MC, for taking me on your show. You're a great person. I'm very happy to have met you and I look forward to a safari we do together in Africa at some point. Absolutely. Thank you to all of my listeners and my viewers for spending most valuable resource, your time once again with me on the show. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals. And you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.